CBS Pittsburgh. And our special guest is Professor Costas Panagopoulos, who is the chair of the political science department at Northeastern University in Boston. Professor, thank you, sir, very much for being with me. My pleasure, good to see you, John. So let me ask you about polling. We are seeing polls every single day here in Pennsylvania, and a lot of folks just dismiss them because polls have been so bad in the past. What, first of all, I guess the basic question is, can you really poll for a result? Is there a way to do a good poll? Well, uh, polls are only as good as the methodology. So uh, they're much less precise than people perceive them to be, but they're also snapshots in time. And they may or may not accurately predict what happens on election day. That doesn't necessarily mean the poll was bad. It could have been great for that moment in time, but not necessarily reflect what's gonna happen on election day. One of the challenges that pollsters face in conducting polls is estimating the likely electorate. Those are the preferences you really want to know about because those are the people who are going to vote on election day. You really don't care about the views and preferences of people who aren't going to vote. And that's more of an art than a science. Pollsters haven't nailed down exactly how to include in their samples only those people who are going to vote on election day. And that's one of the biggest reasons why poll results bounce around and why there are such disparities between polling organizations in terms of the results. It's not necessarily that preferences are jumping around or that pollsters can't nail them down accurately. It's just that the mechanics they use to estimate the likely voter populations differ and they can be imprecise. You know, that was an, exp an excellent explanation. You know, how do you know who a likely voter is? Because most people are going to tell you they're going to vote. Even if yes. not. In, fact, uh, in fact, many people tell you they voted uh, after the fact when they didn't actually vote. But uh, the truth is that, you know, you can only rely on the information that people report about their likelihood of voting. Uh, and some posters are even using voter files and voter history to estimate statistically the likelihood that someone will vote and only reach out to those people in polls. These uh, registration-based polls that are based on voter files, et cetera, uh, can be somewhat more accurate, but at the end of the day, they are also not perfectly accurate because many people who legitimately plan to vote on election day don't end up doing so for one reason or another. Now, I will say that there is this perception after 2016 in particular that the polls were bad. The truth is that the national polls were actually quite good. Uh, it was a very close election. And if you look at what happened on election day, the national polls pretty much got it right. They predicted Hillary Clinton would win the popular vote, which she did by about the amount that the polls suggested she would. The state-based polls were not as good as the national polls and that's partly because they were largely based on smaller sample sizes with larger margins of error, which means that the true uh, preferences uh, filled a much wider gap. Uh, they were uh, somewhat less accurate than the national polls, but that's just partly a function of the challenges of conducting polls within s smaller state populations. So, Professor, what would you recommend as a decent sample and margin of error when polling a state uh, where we expect ooh, six to seven million voters here in Pennsylvania? Well, that's a hard question to answer. It depends on what level of uncertainty people are comfortable with. Some people are not comfortable with any uncertainty at all. And so if you want to narrow the sample uh, margin of error down to a percentage point or two, you need at least 1,500 or a couple of thousand people. Polling is very expensive. Very few polls are going to contain 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 or more uh, respondents in their samples. I think the best thing that viewers and voters can do is take these grains with a grain of, take these polls with a grain of salt. They can look and get a sense of what the preferences are uh, reported in a poll conducted at a particular time. But in my view, they're much better off looking for trends in the polling. Small differences over time that suggest either that, str that strength for a candidate is climbing or eroding, for example. 
These give uh, voters a clearer sense of what the dynamics are of voter preferences in these elections, rather than nailing down very specifically pinpointing the exact level of preferences. I think that uh, that can be very, very risky, but you do get a clearer sense if there's any shifts over time in a particular direction when you look at multiple polls over a long period of time. Well, of course, here in Pennsylvania, we're getting polls that say that it's a neck and neck race between Trump and Biden and others showing Biden with double digit leads. Mm -hmm. So it gets very confusing to the voter out there. I understand what you're saying about trend lines, yeah. um, but uh, still there's such a variation among these polls. Does margin of error, what does that mean exactly? And would you say a poll with 3% or 2% would be much better than a poll with four or five or 6%? Well, uh, percent margin of error, yes. Uh, you know, a poll with five or six percent uh, margin of error that shows a difference between the candidates of less than a few percentage points basically means it's a dead heat. So even if a candidate is ahead by a few percentage points, statistically, they may not be ahead. It may be a tied race, or it, it's even conceivable that the other candidate might be ahead. So uh, polling uh, mechanics are not necessarily... Uh, so, you know, voters are not experts in polling mechanics. It's hard for them to look at the nitty gritty of the methodology. But as a general rule of thumb, unless differences are at least five or six percentage points in a decently sized sample, it's very hard to imply that one candidate is actually ahead of the other. Uh, that type of difference can be totally attributable to statistical uh, error or statistical uncertainty. Uh, professor, let me go back to 2016, because you alluded to this. And of course, uh, you're quite right that the national polls were accurate. It was the state polls, and we're dealing with three or four states that made the difference in the Electoral College. Um, I've heard it said that there, was, there's, there are a couple different problems that went wrong. One was something called non-response bias where you just can't, there are plenty of people who just won't take polls and yet they're gonna vote. Is that a problem for pollsters? Yes, it's a big problem because in order to make inferences to larger populations like a statewide electorate, you need to have a random representative sample of that population. And if the kinds of people pollsters are calling or reaching out to in order to be included in the sample simply refuse to be included in it, refuse to respond, that doesn't necessarily mean you will have a representative sample. And so pollsters, ha pollsters have to adjust their estimates, sometimes through statistical weighting, to pretend they have a representative sample when they actually don't. So that kind of non-response bias can be very problematic for polls because you're not necessarily getting a representative snapshot of the electorate, and pollsters have to somewhat uh, use statistical methods to come up with a sample that uh, attempts to look like that electorate when it actually doesn't. It's a big problem for pollsters, but you know it's not uncommon for some polls to, to have uh, response rates uh, of uh, 30 or 25 percent of the people they reach out to. Sometimes some polls are even in the single digits in terms of the response rate um, they ultimately get on uh, for their polls. Yeah. And the other issue that I have heard about, it's the so-called Bradley effect, uh, referencing uh, a former Los Angeles mayor, African-American mayor who ran for governor. Um, but we also hear it called the Trump effect as well, or the, the shy Trump voter. These are individuals who basically won't tell you they'll, they'll mislead you or they'll lie about who they're voting for one way or the other, simply because they don't like pollsters, they don't want to admit to what they're doing, uh, and you know they give you an answer that isn't accurate. Does that happen a lot in polling? Well, there isn't much evidence that that of a shy Trump voter in polls in 2016. There was some claims about that. There has been uh, the so-called Bradley effect, uh, people who aren't necessarily truthful with pollsters, particularly when there are candidates of color on the ballot. Uh, this was a claim advanced in 2016, and it has been examined, and the studies that I'm aware of suggest that there wasn't very much evidence of a shy Trump effect. And on the flip side of that, it could be people who are very enthusiastic, who are uh, you know, also not accurately characterizing their preferences, uh, because even some enthusiastic voters may end up not voting on election day. 
And then uh, finally, Professor, most Americans never get called, or at least they're not at their phones. And nowadays, by the way, they do poll cell phones, do they not? And that's not yes. just those landlines. Yeah, uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, samples of, of voters that do blend uh, phone-based um, phone call, you know, let me, let me try that again, John, right? Sure. Uh, you know, pollsters are um, integrating cell phones uh, into their samples because we know that many voters in the country just don't have landlines and they have uh, mobile lines only. And so those are being integrated into the samples. Also a very challenging thing to do for pollsters, but it is happening more and more. So what are the chances that you're gonna get called for a poll? Do you have any idea? Well, with the uh, proliferation of polls that we've seen in recent years, the chances are getting better and better that people will be called. Um, at any, for any given poll that's conducted, say nationally, every voter should have the same chances of being called to be included. Uh, but those chances might include, might be somewhere along the lines of uh, one in uh, 200, 250 million each time a poll is conducted. So chances are still pretty small, but the more polls that are conducted, the better the chances are. Well, you're sure right about the polls. It seems like we're getting, as I say, one every other day. Final uh, comments, uh, Professor. What's your advice to those of us who, uh, you know, at least see all these polls out there? Should we pay attention to them? Should we care about them? What uh, you did say, grain of salt. I certainly appreciate that. Uh, final words on this. Well, I do think that voters can get a sense of where the race stands by looking at the polls. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that not all polling organizations are the same. There are some pollsters that are more reputable than others. There are others who are uh, not only not reputable, but they're partisan pollsters that may have a vested interest in presenting one uh, side in a better light than another. Uh, sometimes uh, those are important considerations for voters. But voters also now have the advantage of poll aggregators out there that take all sorts of these considerations into account and uh, sort of average out, smooth out the polls uh, in a way that uh, error in these polls can somewhat balance out. You can get um, perhaps a clearer sense of what not only the um, overall estimates are in preferences, but also how they evolve over time. Those types of poll aggregators also provide a service for voters that help them to, to kind of uh, look across lots of different polls conducted in a certain jurisdiction and give them a sense of what the um, jurisdiction's preferences are. Well, Professor Costas Panagopoulos, always a pleasure to be with you. You did an excellent job with this. Uh, thank you, sir, very much. Thank for you. Me. Anytime, John. Take care. Just because the weekend starts doesn't mean our commitment to excellence stops. Wake up to KDKA TV News Saturday and Sunday morning.